get through this. Um, thank you for what you did three years ago today. Um, please tell me your thoughts um, on this third anniversary. I'm going to try to get through the show today because <laughs> when I see an MSNBC anchor cry, it makes me cry. Because <laughs> January 8th, 2024, Monday, one week from the first primary. That's right, the Iowa caucus. One week from today, we shall see. Oh, I'm Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report. We're live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and Locals. Share, subscribe, tap that notification bell if you have not. Post-game show, as always, rubinreport.locals.com. And yes, over the weekend, it was the anniversary of January 6th, and most of us survived. We're doing okay. That is not what the show is really about today. Today, it is going to be an extension of what we did on Friday, our show with Colin Wright and Andy No, our uh, Friday recap of the week. Uh, the DEI thing is beginning to D-I-E. That's right. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is beginning to actually die. Enough people are seeing it. They are seeing the indoctrination through how the system has, how the system, how the Marxists, how the activists, how they've basically subverted uh, all of the good stuff that this country was based upon. And they've brainwashed, uh, you could say, at least a generation, but probably several generations. But something at the beginning of this year of 2024, something really seems to be shifting and as I've been saying over the last couple of weeks, when we get some wins, we can't just pat ourselves on the back and then just look away. We have to just keep going because otherwise the culture of victimization that we have all been part of for these last couple of years, and we've, as we've watched all of our institutions collapse, all of our sense makers disappear, all of the goodness of America seemingly just like whittle away, uh, it will continue unless we take some wins when we get them. Uh, so we're going to talk about all of that and also how it's affecting even some of the people on the right right now, because even when people on the right get some wins, they have a, a default position to kind of go back and, and do things the wrong way. So I want to start today uh, with a video of a former guest of the Rubin Report, multi-time guest, uh, Dr. Deborah So, who is a sex researcher. She's been on the show many times. She was on Joe Rogan's show a couple days ago. And she was talking about that famous, or infamous, depending on which side of the aisle you're on, I suppose, uh, that famous Yuri Bezmenov video that we've shown you clips of multiple times, uh, particularly over the last couple of months. Yuri Bezmenov uh, was a KGB agent for the Soviet Union, and he explains in this video that we're also going to show you a clip of that, uh, how ideological subversion works. Dr. So brought it up with Joe Rogan. I know you appreciate all of the craziness that's been happening in academia in terms of the, I watched um, Yuri Bezmenov. I know you mm -hmm. talk a lot about him and the defector. Yeah. And I feel like he must be, he must be psychic or something because what he describes in terms of ideological subversion and how to control basically an entire generation by going through academics and teaching them at a young age how to think, what to think more specifically, and how to then get people to a place where they can't agree on what objective reality is. That's essentially what's happening on university campuses. So for myself, having come through academia, finishing my PhD, realizing that I wouldn't be able to stay there and do legitimate research anymore. Um, and so I have to come on the, well, not I have to come on the biggest podcast in the world. I'm very excited and grateful to be here. But I'm like, why don't I just do my own research and do it this way and not have to be con constrained by a particular way of thinking or ha knowing I have to find certain things with my research in order for it to be published. And if it does get published because and it goes against what activists want you to say, it's going to get pulled. Your funding is going to get pulled. You're going to end up homeless anyway. So I'm <laughs> 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 might, as, might as well just go for, straight from A to B. The Yuri Bez off uh, interview from I think it was 84 yeah um, is so crazy because back then I'm sure people were like come on this is nonsense yeah. this is not but if you look at it now in 2023 like he was telling the truth he has to have been telling the truth and that the Soviet Union had planned this out 
for generations and that they knew that this was going to be a 10, 20, 30 year project. And it's been successful. Okay. So we've shown you some of those Yuri Bezmenov clips. We're going to show you another one in just a second. But the basic idea here that Dr. So is laying out that the, 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 the concept of how to take out a country is not that complex. If you can get a whole bunch of young people, if you can get a generation to think that the founding of the country was evil, that good is bad and bad is good, not to know their gender, all, all of the stuff that we're constantly talking about, right? That you could, you could basically subvert and destroy a country without ever picking up a weapon. Now it's interesting, uh, she said maybe he's psychic, which she was kind of joking about, but it's like, it's not that he was psychic, it's not that he could see the future. He understood the methods that the KGB and that the Soviets were using in America and have been using in America now for at least three, four decades. Um, interestingly, I'll, I just said to Phoenix, we'll, we'll get her back on the show, she's been on a few times. Her own awakening related to all this, because she was a lefty uh, back in the day, she was doing sex research, and basically she was seeing that there is a problem with all of this trans stuff, and that there is a social contagion element to it, and the powers that be did not want her to publish her uh, stories and her research, so she had her own awakening. Now let's go to Yuri Bezmenov himself and uh, hear a bit more on ideological subversion. Ideological subversion, that is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriyatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism. Okay, I know we've shown you portions of that before and we will continue show, to show you portions of it because it is explaining what has happened in America and what has led us to this very moment right now. This very moment, which as I said at the top of the show, we are starting to wake up to and a whole bunch of people are now pushing back on. But if you take the basic ideas like America isn't good, and you teach that to a generation, uh, that the country was founded on racism, and you teach that for a generation or two, that two plus two doesn't equal four, and you teach that for a while, that having a penis has nothing to do with being a boy, and you teach that for a while, et cetera, et cetera. You could see how you'd end up in a place where we would be in this constant state of hysteria that we seem to be in. But now I want to connect all of that to how it actually takes out the institutions. Now, of course, we've spent a large part of the last two weeks or so talking about what's gone on at Harvard with the plagiarism scandal or the anti-Semitism scandal, and that basically everything at Harvard is, is fake and, and pure BS in essence. But let's check another institution. So the Dallas Mavericks, NBA team, the Dallas Mavericks, owned by Mark Cuban, we're going to talk about him in just a moment, uh, they have fully allowed diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, into their system. It's something that Mark Cuban believes in, and his CEO, who goes by the name of Cynthia, not goes by the name, her name is Cynthia Marshall, I suppose, uh, she is big on DEI, and here is a video of her explaining why uh, and how she believes in DEI, and what they should do about people who do not believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion wanted to also focus on emotional safety. And I told the team, 
Uh, these uh, values would be on the walls, but more importantly, they would operate in the halls. And so then we went through a series of uh, sessions to really dig into those values and what it meant to have values-based employment uh, at the Dallas Mavericks. And then the 100-day plan was in four parts, and it was to model zero tolerance. Uh, so set up a hotline, complaint process, et cetera, do an investigation, purge what we needed to purge, uh, a MAVS women's agenda, so a very uh, descriptive agenda around elevating, empowering, and just educating women, uh, cultural transformation, which is all the things around diversity and inclusion, employee engagement, our employer resource group, just the things we needed to do uh, to institutionalize an inclusive culture. Um, and then operational effectiveness, basic things like market-based compensation, performance reviews, gender pay equity analysis, all that. So it was about 200 initiatives. Ooh, lady, there is a lot there. Now, remember, this is the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. Her job is to make the Dallas Mavericks basketball team as functional as possible, right? To win as much as possible, to make as much money as possible, to bring in the proper coach, the proper GM, have the entire structure there so they have the best freaking basketball team, so they sell out every game, so they have everyone watching, bring on the best players, selling jerseys, et cetera, et cetera. Everything she talked about there had nothing to do with that. My friend Pete Bogosian, who obviously has been on the show many times, he often talks about this, that once you allow diversity, equity, and inclusion into any company, your eye is off the ball. If your job is to sell widgets and suddenly you're deciding how many black salespeople you have and how many white janitors you have, you're not going to sell as many widgets. Well, now you see that as a institutionalized piece of what's going on uh, with the Dallas Mavericks. A couple things she talked about there. They're gonna have a series of sessions based on values-based employment. So it has less to do with, I don't know, the work that you do, the value that you create. It's gonna be about their values, which of course has something to do with race and racism. They're gonna have zero tolerance. I guess that means if someone accidentally misgenders somebody, zero tolerance, and a hotline. They also have a hotline that you can call to basically rat out your coworkers. Do we have a hotline like that here? There is a hotline. I've been uninformed about that hotline. Um, all right, there's, there's a whole bunch more here, but I wanna connect this to what's going on uh, with Mark Cuban, which we'll do in just a sec. Let me talk to you guys about Cozy Earth. You guys all know the value of good night's sleep. We feel better, look better, have energy to spare. The list goes on and on, yet sleep never made my resolution to-do list. I guess because it seemed like a lost cause. I was either too hot, too cold, too something. That is until I discovered Cozy Earth Bedding. Guys, it's amazing. I love using their products. Here's why I love Cozy Earth Bedding. They were founded to transform lives by offering the softest, most luxurious, and responsibly sourced bedding in the world. The bedding is ethically sourced using premium viscous from highly sustainable bamboo, and their beds are naturally temperature regulating and breathable, so you sleep more comfortably all year round. Cozy Earth Bedding comes with a 100 night sleep trial, which means you have up to 100 nights to sleep on them, wash them, try them out, if you're not completely in love, just return them within 100 days for a full refund. And all of their products also include a 10-year warranty against defects. Whether it's their luxury bedding, ultra comfortable loungewear, plush bath towels, and more, make the new year cozier with Cozy Earth. If you've never tried Cozy Earth, I've got some news for you. You can save up to 35% off Cozy Earth right now, but hurry, this offer won't last long. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter promo code DAVE at checkout for up to 35% off your first order. CozyEarth.com, promo code DAVE, CozyEarth.com, promo code DAVE. Trust me, I love this stuff. You will too. And now back to me. Okay, so now I want to connect Yuri Bezmanov, the guy saying there has been a plan to destabilize America and here's how we're going to do it right, and what we now know, what we call diversity, equity, and inclusion is this cultural Marxism that they've pushed into all of our institution over decades. You have a former KGB agent saying it, right? Then you've got a sex re researcher on Joe Rogan talking about it. You guys have been paying attention to it on this show. Okay, we understand all that. Then we go to a place like uh, Dallas, with the Dallas Mavericks, NBA basketball team, supposed to be focused on winning championships, but mostly focused on figuring out how many black people will do this and white people will do this and lesbians will do that and all that. Dallas Mavericks owned by Mark Cuban. Uh, Elon Musk owns Twitter. Uh, he is not a fan of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I wanna start this off by showing you two tweets from Elon. He wrote this, DEI is just another word for racism. Shame on anyone who uses it. Yes, that's right. And that's in reference to a tweet by Bill Ackman, which I suspect 
We'll talk a bit more about Bill Ackman throughout the week, but let's just move on to the next tweet from Elon. He wrote, discrimination on the basis of race, which DEI does, is literally the definition of racism. And of course that is true. There is no such thing as reverse racism. If you don't like white people or you won't hire white people uh, in the name of DEI, you are a racist. Anyway, those are two fairly obvious statements that Elon Musk put out there. Those are the ideas that this country was founded on, on equality and not being racist. That's how things used to work. But Mark Cuban, who owns the Dallas Mavericks, who has allowed all of this nonsense into his corporate institution, uh, he tweeted back at Elon, and he wrote a bit of an essay here. I'm gonna try to get you guys through it. He wrote, let me help you out and give you my thoughts on DEI. Number one, diversity. Good businesses look where others don't to find the employees that will put your business in the best possible position to succeed. You may not agree, but I take it as a given that there are people of various races, ethnicities, orientation, etc., that are regularly excluded from hiring consideration. By extending our, our hiring search to include them, we can find people that are more qualified. The loss of DEI-phobic companies is my gain. 1A. We live in a country with very diverse demographics. In this era where trust of businesses can be hard to come by, people tend to connect more easily to people who are like them. Having a workforce that is diverse and representative of your stakeholders is good for business. Two, equity. Treating people equally does not meeting, mean treating them the same. I made the mistake for a lot of years thinking it did. Equity is a core principle of business. Put your employees in a position to succeed. Recognize their differences and play to their strengths wherever possible. It is not a hard concept, but it is not easy to implement. Most workforces don't have the depth of management to do this well. When it's not done well, it can create tension and resentment. Three, inclusion. One of my favorite sayings is that great employees reduce the stress of those around them. Great companies create great envi uh, create environments that reduce unnecessary stress of their employees. I'm not talking hitting quota or getting the product out of the door stress, which in turn increases productivity. This is what inclusion is all about, making all employees, no matter who they are, or how they see themselves, feel comfortable in their environment and able to do their jobs. Again, it's not easy. Or why DEI is like healthcare. One of the lessons I've learned in healthcare is that most CEOs don't know and don't really want to know where their healthcare benefit dollars are going. In their minds, it's not part of the core competency of their business. As a result, they waste a shitload of money on less than quality care for their employees, and more often than not, it's their sickest and lowest paid employees that subsidize the rebates and deductibles. Sicker employees have to pay to their deductible, healthy don't. So what does this have to do with DEI? Like healthcare, DEI is not seen as a core competency in most companies, it's just a huge expense. Intellectually, they see the benefit of DEI, but they don't have time to focus on it, so it turns into a checkbox that they hope they don't have to deal with beyond having HR do a report to the board and legal tells them they are covered. Don't worry, I'm almost there, guys. When anything that impacts all of your employees is pretty much a checklist item to the CEO, there is a good chance that it is not going to work well and you are going to have employees who are not comfortable for a lot of different reasons, which in turn creates resentment towards DEI policies and training, which in turn makes it harder on the managers trying to implement it. When companies do DEI well, you see, uh, you see a well-run, successful company. So what's the conclusion? If you don't think there is a need for DEI and it doesn't create a competitive advantage for your company, just look at the ex post replies quotes below. These are the same people that work for you or your coworkers. Everyone is entitled to their point of view, but these same feelings, even if they are not said out loud, are heard loud and clear at work. Okay, before I get into my response, Phoenix, what did you call that when someone gives you just like an essay? When you say something very simple and they give you a long essay in response, what did you call that? That's the liberal college girl response, right? Elon Musk wrote like one, he, two tweets there, but like one-liners. And that is just the long ass explanation. Uh, I responded to Mark and I think I if I dare I say I whittled it down fairly well to the problem of what his essay was all about. I said, Mark, you are defining words in a way nobody else does and certainly not how they put them into practice. He did respond. He wrote, well, we disagree there. These are things I do my best to put into practice. 
my point was that he, it's not that he's not putting what he's saying into practice. It, the point is that nobody else is using DEI the way he's pretending to define it. Let's put it that way. Anyway, after his long diatribe explaining his version of DEI, right? We know it's not, we just heard from his own CEO at his company talking about all the ways they're using DEI. Um, Elon responded, and I think he nailed it. He wrote, cool. So when should we expect to see a short white slash Asian women on the Mavs? Uh, which is a good point because I don't think there are any short white or and, and or Asian women on the Dallas Mavericks. Mark Cuban responded to that. He said, since this seems to be the most common response, let me address it. DEI does not mean you don't hire on merit. Of course you hire on, you hire on merit. Diversity means you expand the possible pool of candidates as widely as you can. Once you have identified the candidates, you hire the best person you believe is the best. What makes the whole what about the players comment ridiculous is that it presumes that all positions are hired based on some quantitative rather than subjective version of merit. They aren't. Even choosing the best basketball player is very much a guess, which is why the best players weren't always the first pick in the draft and some go undrafted. The reality is that most positions hired in a company don't have a quantitative metric you can use to hire someone. How do you pick the best barista, sales assistant, marketing, or salesperson, etc.? God, there's so much BS here. More often than not, it's an educated guess. So when you see a company like IBM say they want to add X percent more people of color or women or whatever group, they already know that the majority of positions they hire for don't have metrics for picking best. I don't know how, you, how Mark Cuban ever created a successful company. As Elon Musk said, if merit for a job is roughly the same, then the tiebreaker should be diversity of all kinds, which is exactly what well-managed companies choose to do. DEI also does not mean you can't fire someone if you've made a mistake. Of course you can. I'm a big believer in hire first, uh, hire slow, fire fast. It's, if it's the wrong person, fire them. Finally, let me address the thought that I'm virtue signaling. I wrote this on X because I knew very well that almost everyone on here would disagree with me. I don't virtue signal. I want people to challenge my positions. I wanna have engaging discussions that help me learn. Uh, he then uh, put out, all right, so first off, you know, I, I know I'm being a little snippy, let's say, with Mark Cuban. I just think he, he's completely misunderstanding this, but I, I will give credit where credit is due. He, did post this on Twitter, where he knows most people are going to disagree with him. I don't really think he's, well, I can't say I don't really think he's run his companies like this, because clearly he's running the Dallas Mavericks like this with the CEO over there. But with all the tech companies he has, I don't know how many companies he's in charge of or, or has put money towards. Like, I don't think that they've, in the tech companies that he's created, let's say, hired people with any with thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion. You, you get the best programmers, and of course you do that. When we created Locals, were we looking at their race or who they bang on the side? Of course not. It was like, could you code? You think I care who these guys bang on the side? I don't care what you people are doing all day. I really don't. As long as you show up for work and you do a good job and you smile every now and again, and, and that's it. Tell me how great I am. Anyway, uh, then Mark basically completely blew up his own uh, argument. He tweeted a link to ESPN, and uh, it says, Cuban would give Griner a chance with Mavericks. Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban would be willing to give Baylor women star Brittany Griner an opportunity to play on the Mavs. The problem is, Brittany Griner would never make the Mavericks, and it's because she's a woman, right? We all know that. There's a reason that the WNBA exists. It's nice that girls like to play basketball. I went to high school, I'm a little bit older than her, but I went to the same high school as Sue Bird. She is thought of as the greatest female basketball player of all time. I played a couple times with her in the park and she was pretty damn good, but she wasn't better than most of the guys and she could have never made it to the NBA. So if you, t if, is it fair to say Brittany Griner's the best female basketball player right now? No, who, who's the best? Tarazzi, Diana Taurasi, but she retired, right? Yeah, like Brianna Stewart. Brianna Stewart, look at this guy, he knows God bless you for knowing the names of several female basketball players. The point is nobody knows their names and it's it's fine that girls like basketball. I love basketball. And girls can like things, boys can like different things. It's, it's all good. 
But Mark saying that and posting a link to it, yeah, I'd give her a chance. Well, you'd give her a chance and she would fail at it. She is, what do you tell me, 69205, something like that. 69205, so a 6'9 male basketball player, you're usually about 250, jacked huge, you're a power forward. She would be crushed by these people. It's just the truth and we all know it. Uh, Ashley St. Clair, she's an actual journalist. I think we have her on the show later this week. Uh, we've played a couple things from her lately. Uh, she responded to Mark Cuban and I thought her response was uh, quite clarifying. She wrote, DEI is not seen as a core competency in most companies. It's just a huge expense. She's quoting him there. Uh, yes, and anytime you make something like DEI a requirement, it will turn into checklists and eventually a lucrative industry. You give a pretty literal breakdown of DEI from a definition standpoint, but seem to gloss over what DEI and sister programs such as affirmative action have become in actuality, which is ironically rather discriminatory. Equity and equality are also wrongly conflated here. The reality of DEI is destroying meritocracy to hire based on race and gender for extra social credit points and government bucks. This is wrong and will only breed further division in this country. That is the point. So again, I, I don't mean this to totally crap on Mark Cuban. He's trying to have a complex fight out in the open and it is good to be able to debate these things. But it is fairly obvious that when it comes to bringing on the best basketball players, you can say, I'm gonna bring on uh, this black woman, but she will never make the team. Where are the Asians on the Dallas Mavericks, the Asian females? So DEI is bad, actually, I think we can say it plainly, it's bad because it is morally wrong. Discrimination based on race is wrong, and it does not matter which direction it goes in. But there's another reason it's wrong that I think gets more to Yuri Bezmenov and everything else we've been talking about here. It's wrong because it reduces the quality of our outcomes and our products. So when you start thinking that, that these institutions aren't working and we're teaching everyone the wrong thing and products aren't as good as they used to be, and, and I hear this from tons of friends who own or run businesses, that you can't hire people anymore because nobody knows anything, nobody knows how to do anything and work ethic has been destroyed. And you've had to hire these people because, oh my God, that person looked like that instead of hiring the best person. So Mark might maybe can be one of the few people that can slightly get that needle through there and make it all work. I suspect that he can't, again, because of that very video that we showed you of the, of the CEO. Uh, but when you scale all of the wrong ideas across a societal level, then it reduces the quality of life for a nation. And that is exactly where we are at right now. So let me give you a perfect example of it. What is happening right now, right this very second, at what was thought of as our most prestigious university in the entire country, Harvard. Well, Harvard is an absolute free fall because they decided over the course of several decades, a couple decades ago it was they were gonna discriminate against Jews because too many Jews were getting good grades and working hard and caring about family and all of those things which are deeply connected uh, to living a successful life and there were too many, quote unquote, too many Jews at Harvard so they had quotas against Jews. Then what happened over the last decade or so? It moved on from Jews and they didn't want Asians there, right? Because too many Asians were coming in, this is in their mind, and they started discriminating against Asians because they wanted more black and brown students. And you might think, okay, but it's nice they wanted more black and brown students. That's not mean. But why would you discriminate against an Asian kid who works hard? That is racism. Okay, so I wanna flash to two things that we showed you last week to, to bring this, uh, to tie this together. Uh, first off, Claudine Gay has now resigned, obviously, as president of Harvard. She is keeping her $900,000 job. That's pretty sweet when you resign. Uh, she will be teaching political science, which is just absolutely perfect. Uh, but let's not forget, in her six-month tenure, she was applauded. It was The media loved the fact that they had hired this black woman, who I'm told is not actually gay, it's just in her name. But remember this, this is the, this is the mainstream media applauding this diversity hire. 
Harvard University making it history by naming its first black president. Well, for the first time in history, a black woman will lead Harvard University. Some more good news here. A Stanford alum and former professor has been named Harvard University's first black president. Their very first president of color. She will be the first person of color. First president of color. Claudine Gay will be the first president of color and second female president in the school's history. She's also only the second woman to hold that position. She will be the second woman and the first black person to lead the university. She was born to Haitian immigrants. The daughter of Haitian immigrants, Professor Gay, is a widely admired higher educated, uh, higher education leader and recognized as a highly influential expert on American political participation. Harvard has always found a way to meet the moment. We have a long history of rising to meet new challenges, of converting this energy into forces of renewal and reinvention. I'm clapping for her. Yeah. Washington Free Beacon reporting that Harvard has received a complaint as more plagiarism accusations now emerge. They're piling up against the president, Claudine Gay. This according to the Washington Free Beacon. These instances of plagiarism were first reported by the Washington Free Beacon. Nearly 50 accusations of distinct incidents of plagiarism. Embattled president Claudine Gay is set to resign imminently. Okay, so you get the point there, right? So the media six months ago, oh my God, this is so incredible. We got this black woman, it's so exciting, right? No information about what her resume is or anything else. And then of course, not only does she have this, this unbelievably awful congressional hearing where she can't condemn whether you can call for genocide of your Jewish students on campus, but then at least 50 instances of plagiarism. So because Harvard believed in DEI, not only in the students, but also in the faculty and the administrators all the way up to the president, they were hiring not the best people. I think it is fair to say that Claudine Gay was not the best choice, but she was the DEI choice. Uh, let's not forget how CNN covered it when uh, she got caught plagiarizing. These plagiarism allegations uh, where Claudine Gay has had to issue corrections, um, multiple corrections. Now. We should note that um, Claudine Gay has not been accused of stealing anyone's ideas in any of her writings. Uh, she's been accused of sort of a, more like a copying uh, other people's writings without attribution. So it's been more sloppy ap attribution than stealing anyone's ideas. But I, I had to show you that one again because it's just one of the best. We, she hasn't been accused of stealing, just copying. It's the exact same thing, but that shows you. So not only did Harvard through DEI or DEI hire somebody who should have not been hired in the first place. So that's the educational institution. But then we see our media institution, CNN, running cover for this ridiculous thing, literally running cover for a plagiarist. And by the way, she plagiarized Amongst many things she plagiarized, she plagiarized from a black female scholar by the name of Carol Swain, who we should get on the show. Um, so, okay, you get it. The end result is that it brings, DEI brings in, it ushers in a reduction in quality uh, in places like Harvard and in places like CNN and basically anywhere that it is instituted. So once you hire based on DEI, once you look at a resume, we, we just made a hire this weekend. I did not do it based on gender or on sexuality or on skin color, did we? No, not that one, the other one. We, no, you hire based on the best freaking person. It's as simple as that. So of course, as you know, what happened to uh, Claudine Gay? Well, then she portrayed herself as the victim. Tweet here from Greg Price. Breaking, Claudine Gay just published an op-ed in the New York Times where she decries attacks on education and expertise. She says she fell into a well-laid trap before Congress and says that the people who called for her firing trafficked in lies and stereotypes about, about black talent. So of course she did all that. Like we knew that was coming. Uh, if you watch Friday's show, Colin Wright, who I had on, he had predicted that that was exactly what she was gonna do, that she was gonna be the victim. There was no well-laid trap in the congressional hearing. All she had to do was say, oh, you can't call for genocide of Jewish students on campus. And she would have not been fired. Like she would have been able to skate away from this thing because she would have used the blackness, the identity politics, it would have worked, but she then got the full storm of the genocide thing and the plagiarism thing. It was a bit much. Anyway, how else? Again, how does this destroy institutions? We've watched it destroy Harvard. We just showed you the clip of CNN running cover. This is a beauty from the AP, the Associated Press. 
Harvard president's resignation highlights new conservative weapon against colleges, plagiarism. Yes, and Clay Travis, uh, my buddy, he, he tweeted that out. He wrote, I'm cautiously optimistic that 2024 will lead to widespread recognition among those with functional brains that most journalists in America are just left-wing propagandists. Like really, look at that headline. Harvard president's resignation highlights new, it's the conservative weapon. Only conservatives would care about plagiarism. Shouldn't we all care about plagiarism? And I will say once again, as I said on the show last week, it, there is AI out there now where they can start looking at everybody's dissertations and papers and they can try to match things up and they can do it super quickly and easy. If you show me 50 white, male, straight, rich, Republican college presidents, well, there are no Republican college presidents, but if you show me a bunch of white guys who have stolen a bunch of stuff and this can be done very, very easily, then they all have to be fired if we're to believe that these institutions are, are worth the, the paper that the degrees are printed on and perhaps they aren't. Anyway, uh, more of the media running cover. Here's Al Sharpton uh, deflating. He's a def the man is deflating. Every time I look at him, I think he's deflating. Uh, he's saying that Claudine Gay is mostly, uh, they're going after her, well, because she's black, she's a woman, blah, blah, blah. Gays somehow get in there. The was to make up for the denial historically of blacks, of women, of gays, of Latino, of Asians. And since this man decided that he would stand up and say that taking out Dr. Guy is a beginning of taking out DEI. I want to come to his office and let him know that we will fight him. We said nothing when the fight was at heart, but now he's declared war against all of us. DEI is something we must have to equalize the playing field. DEI is something we must have to equalize the playing field. No, not in the things that I'm gonna be part of, not in the way America was set up to be, not in the things that will lead us to the future. If you want DEI, now I get it, Al Sharpton, you, you are racist, you have a long track record of racist uh, uh, comments and actions. You're, you're one of the biggest race hustlers uh, in this entire country. Um, so if you want to keep running with that, then you will go ahead, but we must make DEI DIE. It is as simple as that. She would not be in trouble right now had she not plagiarized, right? Are you saying that the old, that they're going after her because she's a black woman? The media was, nobody had a problem with the president of Harvard before any of this. Then it came out that she's a plagiarist. Do black people not care about plagiarism? As I said, the woman stole from another black scholar, another black female scholar. Lordy, lordy. But the point of all of this, guys, is that when you take all of these bad ideas that we've been talking about and then you just proliferate them throughout a society, then the good people, the few good people remaining, you watching this right now and the same people who are out there, we all get pinned as the bad guys, right? Al Sharpton would gladly call me a racist. He would gladly call you a racist. And in some ways, that is what now the overriding, uh, I would say, thesis behind the entire Democrat Party platform is. If you are either one of us, you are either an intersectional DEI wokester, or you are a racist. So now I want to show you a video from over the weekend because it was the Third anniversary of January 6th, and uh, here is the elderly man pretending to be President Joe Biden, and what is he doing these days? I thought he was the president to come in and give us some healing, and we were gonna get past all the meanness with Trump and all that stuff. Well, here he is comparing Trump and Trump supporters to Nazis. He calls those who oppose him vermin. He talks about the blood of America as being poisoned. Echoing the same exact language used in Nazi Germany. Joe, we can have some honest discussion about some of the language and behavior of Donald Trump. I don't think I'm being invited to Mar-a-Lago anytime <laughs> soon, right? I've been very critical of Trump. You can feel something happening right now that Trump and Biden are just sort of the mirror images of each other on one, you know, in some respect. That Biden is just, you're all racist, and Trump is, you're all pedophiles. I don't know, something like that. That they are basically building two campaigns. We have two parties building themselves around, you're the victim, no, you're, I know, well, I'm the victim, I'm the victim, you're the victim, you're the victim, and, and we will never get out of this. 
if this is the best that we've got. That is the thing. We will never, if you think that we have problems right now, and we do, we will never get out of this unless we start being honest about our history, honest about current events, honest about things that just happened. So here's Joe Biden, a little bit more from that speech about how we almost lost America on January 6th. January 6th, might I remind you, where nobody brought a weapon, nobody had plans. If you broke the law, fine, and you gotta pay the price, and if you broke windows or you punched anybody or anything like that, okay, fine. But there was no insurrection in the idea that there was anyone out there that was about to topple the government. But here's Joe Biden, we almost lost America. Today we gather in a new year, some 246 years later, just one day before January 6th. A day forever shared in our memory because it was on that day that we nearly lost America. Lost that, that language is insane. It's actually insane. We didn't nearly lose America. It was wrapped up by the end of the day, right? There were people that were, <laughs> there were literally police officers allowing people, moving barricades, allowing people to wander in. I'm not defending every single person that was there or what everyone's intentions were or anything else, but I think you get it. But what Biden needs, Biden needs all of his voters to think they're the victim. My God, those white supremacist insurrectionists are coming for us because that will gin up the base, that will keep everybody fearful, and that will hopefully for him get votes out and then lead to another four years of this lunacy. But I would say the other version of that uh, is Trump. So Trump has been campaigning in Iowa over the last couple of days. Here he is calling on Biden to release the January 6th, what he refers to as hostages, uh, something that he did not do when he had the chance to do it. What they've done, and they ought to, you know what they ought to do? They ought to release the J6 hostages. They've suffered enough. They ought to release them. I call them hostages. Some people call them prisoners. I call them hostages. Release the J6 hostages, Joe. Release them, Joe. You can do it real easy, Joe. This guy, what he's done, what he's done to people. Okay, as you know, Donald Trump was president for two weeks after January 6th, he could have done a little something. The president has pardoning power, he didn't. Uh, Donald Trump, we're also told, is a billionaire, right? They, Donald Trump is a very famous orange billionaire. How much money, could we Google this, how much money has he put towards legal funds of January 6th people? People give him a lot of money for things. Is, is it, would it be a dime or a nickel, maybe 25 cents? I don't think anything. Someone can correct me on that. Why didn't he fund some of that? That, that might have been something he could have do. But anyway, I'm trying to show you that they're just sort of two sides of the same coin, right? He's victimizing himself and his supporters. We need to break out of this death spiral, right? So we've got sort of the DEI left and the victimized right. That is not going to solve any of the problems that we have right now. It simply will not. But perhaps there is a way, perhaps there is a better way. And I mentioned at the top of the show, we are one week from today is the Iowa caucus. And maybe, I know the polls don't bear it out, but maybe some of the people, maybe the Republicans of Iowa will, Iowa will decide to go in a different direction, right? Because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And clearly at this point, we are not getting different results. Um, but I think maybe there's a chance for things to be a little bit better. Here is an ad that the DeSantis people uh, put out just over the weekend. We will break the cycle of amnesty. Those days are over. And yet today, in a remarkable twist, the president held a televised meeting with the very swamp creatures he once denounced. He told them he trusted them to craft immigration policy without his input. The White House proposal would legalize about two million people who currently have no right to be here. That's a lot of people. A path to citizenship. For 1.8 million illegal immigrants, almost three times more people than the previous administration covered. Then he suggested he'd be willing to accept any deal they produced, even a bad one. I will be signing it. I'm not going to say, oh, gee, I want this or I want that. I'll be signing it. And here's the part that made Jeb Bush all warm and fuzzy. It should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love. Very few of the president's supporters voted for that when they put him in office last year, and some of them are upset about it. My kids were born and raised in America. We have dreams, too. Right-wing media like Breitbart calling the president amnesty Don. 
you've given them more than they could ever have expected from Barack Obama. Donald Trump ran on the premise that America's borders ought to be real, that the repeated amnesties of the past have betrayed voters, and that this country deserves an immigration policy that looks out for American interests. If you are in the so-called establishment Republican Party, this has been a great stretch yep. for you. So what was the point of running for president? Okay, as you guys know, I don't have Trump derangement syndrome. I have interviewed the guy, I have been to Mar-a-Lago, I am friends with the kids. I am not trying to be heavy handed here or anything else, but we have had nine years of this. The results are in. Most of the people, Tucker Carlson for God's sakes, most of the people that we just showed you there analyzing what Trump was doing with immigration and amnesty and everything else, those are people that love him, right? That wasn't the lamestream media or the fake news media or anything else. So why would you believe that Trump now, who's angrier, who's turned against so many people who will have trouble hiring and all of those things, that suddenly, if he becomes president again, and by the way, he believes that the last election was stolen, so why wouldn't they just steal it from him again, that he would be able to do all of those things better? Perhaps there is a better choice for the four and maybe even eight years beyond right this moment. You have never lost a political race before in your career. You are a second in the CBS Iowa projections. Um, is that victory enough for you? Well, we got to win a majority of the delegates. This is a long process. We're doing really well in Iowa. You know, I kind of like being underestimated, Margaret, so I hope people kind of say, say that. Uh, but we've got the enthusiasm. When the calendar clicked to 24, you see, we got more undecided voters coming out to all our events. So we're going to outwork everybody. But this is a long process. Uh, there's a lot that happens to accumulate all these delegates. We're going to do well in Iowa but we're also gonna be competing in all these other states. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of real estate. I think a lot of things are gonna happen. I wish the former president would actually debate though. I mean, I think mm -hmm. if you're gonna stand for nomination, you should be able to stand on a stage to do it. I'm happy to debate him on your program or if your network wants to host a debate in New Hampshire, South Carolina. Uh, but the idea that he can go and just read off the teleprompter uh, for 45 minutes and then go back, you know, back home that doesn't cut it in Iowa, and that doesn't cut it in a lot of these states. And so uh, let's go, get on the stage, and, and let's have the, the debate of ideas. And I hope Donald Trump will be willing to do that. All right, guys, so look, I know you know this, but it is fairly obvious to me which direction, let's say first the Republican Party has to go before the country can go if we are gonna fix this from a political level, right? There's a guy with a track record who does what he says he's gonna do, then moves on to new things, who doesn't have all the drama around him and everything else. Like there, there it is right there. Now we are one week from that caucus. And you know, I have a lot of people tweeting at me all the time going, Dave, don't you see the polls? Why, you're going down with the ship with this thing. You know, I believe that fighting for the right thing is the right thing to do no matter what. You know, when we were in California and there was the recall against Gavin Newsom, there was virtually no chance that he was gonna, you know, he was recalled and then there was an election, but there was virtually no chance in a, in a one party state that California is uh, that Gavin Newsom was not gonna win the recall election. But I wanted to give everything I had to Larry Elder because you can wake up enough people. Now, I do believe that Ron DeSantis has a chance and I do believe that people are gonna be shocked uh, next week, one week from today, but Maybe not, maybe not, but that doesn't mean that you don't fight for what is right. So the right, speaking of the right, the right has to make a decision. Which way do you wanna go? Is this just gonna be about cult of personality and the culture wars and the gotcha moments and all of that stuff, or will we make a better choice? And, and we shall see which way we go. It's kind of funny if you think about it, that this is left to just like a couple hundred thousand people in Iowa to really set this thing off is, is sort of interesting. If you're watching this in Iowa, I hope you realize you have an awful lot of power, uh, at least for the next little bit. Uh, but it's not just on the right. We can't just, first off, this is not something that can just be fixed politically, but it's not just something that can be fixed through the Republican Party. The Democrats are gonna have to get better too, right? We know that the inmates are running the asylum with the Democrats. You've got a guy with dementia running the party. You have Hamas activists literally in the party, AOC and Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and the rest of them. Uh, but even that thing, people are seeing through that too. Uh, let's not forget Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Kennedy, Kennedy, the name which is most synonymous with the Democrat party more than any other name, he left the Democrats because of the radicalism. Uh, and I saw this video over the weekend and I thought this was really interesting. If you are frustrated, if you're looking at the election right now, 
and you're going, boy, I really don't like Joe Biden and I don't even think he's in charge and I can see all the problems America has, kind of over the Trump thing, don't really like that, don't like all the drama, he's not even campaigning, won't debate, I've kind of had it with that. Is there another choice? If, the, if these are the two we're left with, right? If the DeSantis thing just doesn't work out. If these are the two we, we are left with. Is there another choice? Well, RFK actually mapped out uh, a possibility and what his shot could be. These are battleground states among young people, voters 18 to 29, and this is a combination of the main battleground states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Um, Trump at 29, Biden at 30, you are at 34 percent. And then voters 30 to, 30 to 44 years old, you beat Trump and Biden at 31 percent. But let me ask you this. In, in, you have to have 270 electoral votes. Can anyone get to 270 if you were to have this kind of, this kind of margin in the, real, in the real situation? We're very confident that we're going to get to 270 votes, as you point out. President Biden, President Trump get on the ballot for free. They're going to force us to spend $15 million to get on the ballot. I only need 34 points to win the election. Because I, I, and technically, I could win with 34 points if the other two got 33. It's winner take all. And that's how I'm going to win. I have 10 months to take 4.5 percentage points from both candidates. And we're very confident that I'm going to do that. Okay. As you guys know, first off, I will fully put it out there, it is a very, very long shot that a guy like RFK and an independent could win, even despite his name and everything else. You also know that I have some political disagreements with him. He was for the affirmative action. Uh, he's for, he is for affirmative action. He was against the Supreme Court reversing it. We got into it, we discussed it on the show. He's definitely more big government than I am, but I know this guy really loves America. I also saw an interview with him a couple of days ago talking about all of his libertarian beliefs like he he is a good decent american that wants to get us past all of the bs um so maybe there is some other way i think that a whole bunch of people i mean if you just look at those numbers right there if you just look at those numbers pe basically people under 44 like him just as much as they like those other guys though people don't like the choices that we have so it's going to be an interesting week we got an interesting week coming up and then we got an interesting couple of weeks after that where this, this will start getting sorted out. Um, but the point of all of this, the point of the show on this Monday is, is that we have been ideologically conditioned for the past 10 years to think that really at this point only our choices are only Trump or some sort of racial, woke, mind-muddled Democrat. Those are the choices we've been given at a national level between the Republicans and the Democrats. We must break this cycle because this cycle is leading us to societal collapse. It actually is. And guess what? There was a guy who did a video about 40 years ago explaining how another country was trying to infiltrate us to create societal collapse. His, his name is Yuri Bezmenov. Have I shown you a video of him? Let's try it again. Ideological subversion, that is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriyatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism. Should we show you that clip one more time today? Did we lay it on thick enough for you? I think you got it. I think you got it. So how about we, me, you, person watching this, 
How about we take some active measures, right? That's one of the phrases he, use, he uses. How about we take some active measures to change the perception of reality? Instead of letting them do it to us, how about we start doing that? And we start standing up for what we believe in and we start voting for different people and supporting good people. It does not have to be this way. It doesn't have to be Trump versus Biden. It doesn't have to be that all of our institutions will collapse and America will fail and all of those things. But we gotta get a backbone like a ramrod. And if we do, I think we can fix this thing. That is a fine Monday program for the people. Speaking of the people, we are live, people of the internet at 1 p.m. today. Uh, if you wanna join us for the post-game show momentarily, rubenreport.locals. Dot com. What do we do for me Monday today? Let's see what we got for me Monday. Do we... That's some fine work you're doing over there, Brock. You're, you're getting lunch today. Uh, that video, believe it or not, is now our number one meme that we've ever shared on Instagram. 60 million views for pushing that Crippled man out of a wheelchair. 2.1 million likes. What a world. Anyway, we leave you with the diversity hire that is now vice president. Post game momentarily. Ciao. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> you exist in the context of all in which you live and what came before you. Hey.